back, folks, to the WP Tonic this week in WordPress and SAS. We've got a great guest. It shows 647 to say we've got a great guest returning, Vito Paylock of Afrim, um, a friend of the show. I've probably butchered his name, butchered the project, butchered everything, but I'm going to let Vito quickly introduce himself and then we'll get into this great interview. Would you like to introduce yourself, Vito, to the trial? Yeah. So I'm Vito, I'm the founder of Atarim, uh, which is a platform that helps web agencies and uh, uh, freelancers to better collaborate with their clients, get to deadlines on time, and systemize the project delivery. That's great. And I've got my great co-host, Stephen. Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself to new listeners and viewers of the tribe? Yeah, Stephen Souter from hustlefish.com. That's great. And before we go into the main point of this video, which is all going to be about Vito's experience of being an agency owner, um, then doing his own SaaS products, what he has learned on this amazing journey, we have to go for our quick break for our major sponsor to tell them about their amazing product. We will be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back. Really looking forward to this interview. Vito is one of my favorite WordPress friends. Um, so, um, Vito, what do you see has, you know, your product helps digital agencies with handling their clients? And you've got a very large um online community through your Facebook groups and your other activities. So you interact with a lot of digital agency, WordPress agency oh, yeah. owners. Are there any kind of consistent problems that you see them dealing with on a daily, weekly basis that you would like to share with the tribe? Right. Yes, we all, they all, we all share the same exact problems. And this is what is, um, uh, this is what is, it was kind of mystifying to me when I got into this game, because as a, as an agency owner, I was living in this, uh, you know, kind of a bubble with my own team and my own clients. And I didn't realize that every experience that I was going through, um, hundreds of other, hundreds of thousands of other uh, people all over the world are going through the exact same challenges. Uh, if we want to pinpoint this to three stuff, there's only three big problems when it comes to running an agency. Um, and uh, the first thing is gathering content from clients, uh, getting uh, designs approved, and getting the clients to really give you the information that you need um, um, uh, on the support or, or on all of those communications. Uh, building websites, no one has a problem to do. That's the that's that's what I learned. Every, everyone can build a website. That is never the challenge. Uh, the challenge is always on the service delivery, getting the 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 um, uh, to the deadlines, um, uh, working with other people to meet those deadlines and to get them to act on the stuff that we do. Now, more than this, what I found is that the re the main reason behind this. And um, uh, I think you guys, you guys would agree. Um, most the the like overwhelming majority of our industry are people are creative people. Uh, we came into this game from just wanting to build a nice website, a, a beautiful website. Maybe came from uh, the graphic side. Maybe came from the code side, which is also as developers, which is also very creative. Um, uh, process. Um, we're not project managers uh, at heart. You know, we're not uh, a, a business owners at heart. We learn how to do this on the go, uh, and we learn from our own experiences and whatever. You know, listening to podcasts and uh, and tr and uh, this and that piece of training, we kind of um, you know patch things together to build um, to build our own business uh, out of this. But our background is rarely starts from this uh, from comes from this world that's why these are the challenges that we have we never have a challenge on the creative side it's always on the project management the the service delivery the business side yeah i think just a quick follow-through question you just touch it because you didn't come you know you get a lot of people that work for agency for a number of years right. as a junior 
and they build relationships and then they go off on their own or with a partnership with, with either another co-founder or a couple of other people they know. But you, you are like me. Um, you were outside the digital WordPress, digital marketing agency industry. You were a musician and then you gradually... Um, I think the consequence of that, I think what a lot of people get burnt out when they're like us, to some extent, is they don't realise the amount of effort and the financial strain because you're gonna because you don't have those relationships, you normally have to take on a lot of work which isn't that well paid and is quite stressful because you're just looking to get work initially. Do you think I'm right about that? And do you think people have got to be realistic and maybe have some money in the bank and realise it's going to be a real grind for the first year, maybe 18 months? Um, I, I don't like uh, having a backup plan. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that if you're doing something, you got to go all in. Um, but that being said, um, it is it is expected that you're not going to make any money on your first few projects. Um, I didn't. I built websites for two hundred dollars that I supposed to charge five grand for. You know, at, uh, when I first started, uh, and uh, it's fine. I think that's part of the journey. And and I didn't feel really bad about this back then because I didn't know anything else. You know, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. I, uh, when um, when I uh, needed to make more money. That that is when the pain became real, and that's when I started realizing that I do need to charge more for uh, for the um, uh, for the service that I'm providing. That's when I realized that I need to find the right clients, and you know, it's it's all a matter of where you are in your personal journey uh, that leads you to finding those questions. But if you're if you're not if you're not feeling the pain. Um, then cool, build a portfolio, you know, do whatever, um, even rely on your spouse for uh, for a couple of months. That that happens as a, as a business owner. That happens sometimes, uh, and, and um, make sure that you have some money saved up for a rainy day because uh, the the agency model is really is like a fist and famine type of model unless you build it properly with care plans and recurring revenue from the beginning. Uh, but undercharging initially. Um, I think it's a good lesson to go through. I, I, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade it really. When um, you're thinking through like building a SaaS, like tr or I guess if you're in the agency world, and you're like, how do I augment this? Like, there's I feel like there's a trend to like go SaaS or recurring revenue, which is kind of almost like a SaaS sort of model in itself, right? Yeah. Um, do you need to? find like that unique pain point that only you can solve or like in like like with I guess what I'm trying to ask is like with you deciding to go from being an agency to building atrium right like you found this very unique pain point decided to solve it a uh care plan um is not necessarily a unique pain point right like right. it is a solution that a lot of other companies have do you think that in today's business climate, is there a need to find this very specific niche that you can own? Or do you think there's plenty of space still in this kind of service model that other people can have just an unequal service to? Right. Um, that's a really good question. I think that depends on your goals. So what what do you aspire to do? Or what wh where where do you see yourself in five years, in 10 years? Uh, for me, we were we we already had a nice uh, flow of cash from recurring uh, customers. To be honest, most of our clients towards the uh, the latter later part of the agency were just the same clients. You know, I, I didn't feel the need of going out there doing cold outreach and uh, doing uh, you know like uh, uh, sh uh, shaking elbows you know post covid um to uh, to bring in new business because we were we we were uh, doing pretty well with that uh, uh 50 uh, recurring clients 100 uh, total clients you know that just came back with more stuff i was nurturing them more than i was uh, concerned about bringing new people in um but i did wanted to go further 
So um, and this is a super valid model. You know, some people and uh, and to be honest, Stephen, this is not something that I, that I realized when I got into the SaaS game. I was under the impression that everyone wants to build a billion dollar company. You know, uh, how do I get to 100 million ARR? That's the kind of uh, a question that was burning in my mind. Um, but mo but a lot of people, and I would say that maybe even uh, um, well more than half of our community are cool with running a small operation uh, with uh, two other folks, you know, along with them, uh, and um, and generating the five ten k a month, and that is that is super valid. Um, it's actually um, a, 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 not only that it's that it's easier to do that. Um, it's a lot less stressful and, um, you know, as opposed to going after a market that or building a product that is innovative, that doesn't exist, that you need to train the market, you need to uh, bring people in and you need to iterate this and invest a whole bunch of money into this. We, we invested well more than $700,000 into the product so far. Um, to bring it to where it is today. And that is still nothing compared to when you're looking at uh, some of the big products that are uh, big SaaS companies that are out there. When you're doing care plans, what are you investing in? Manage WP and Atarim and you're good, you know? That's yeah. it. Yeah, that bar is <laughs> so, a, lot, a lot lower of entry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, you know, everyone needs it. So every person that, uh, uh, that uh, you build a website for is a natural fit for going into those additional services. Um, I, I looked at this like, um, a, you know, like the dentist model. Um, so, you know, when you go to a dentist, uh, they, they bring you in with this um, free, you know, a checkup, right? Uh, but then they tell you, you got to come in every few months. You got to come in every few months. And every time that you come in, they, bring, they hit you with another thing, uh, you know. So um, I see that you're drinking a lot of coffee. Maybe you want to do some whitening. That's like $300 right there and after you if you do that then the next time um okay i see that you had braces when you were a teenager so it looks like the teeth are moving again so maybe we'll get you this uh, uh invisalign i don't know i don't remember what it's called uh, you know so that's another two grand so they they make their profits on the back end and that is something that an agency um a, a, or even a freelancer should keep in mind that um uh, you know the clients are an asset you know, every time that you acquire a customer, it's an asset that you need to nurture and you need to build uh, a, a forever and, and not necessarily go after, you know, raise a bunch of money and build a, a huge team, unless this is what you do. This is what I enjoy. This is my my passion. Um, I like the hunt. I like the game. So um, I, I like I like this path, you know. It's, um, I was listening to Lee Jackson's podcast, um, Agent trailblazer and he was talking about closing down his agency um, because he's got a SaaS product as well um, with a partner and um, he was it was a couple uh, weeks ago he discussed that he was closing down the his agency and he was saying he was finding it very stressful the agency because he was finding that there was a lot of pressure on um, the price, but the actual projects were getting more and more complicated, right. and they, the the deadlines were getting more compressed. So it was more complicated projects and more unrealistic time frames. In your community, is this something you've been observing? People talking about about um, um, well. Commoditiz commoditization of our space is definitely there. You know, unless you find the, um, your edge, uh, then you're just gonna get commoditized. You're just gonna become uh, the flower, not the cake, you know? But uh, you wanna be the fancy cake. So if that is building a complex website or maybe like you're doing, Jonathan, building a, a LMS platforms, um, or focusing on um, on SEO optimized websites, or you know, just finding some niche is way better than just just going down and uh, competing on on price. I see that um, uh, uh, the people that do find their their edge 
have no problem whatsoever charging whatever they uh, they believe is the right uh, price for their model, uh, then the then most of the industry are playing for the scraps really just the. Um, um, they're comp like most of the industry is competing with Fivel and Upwork and um, and uh, uh, you know Wix and stuff like this. I never considered these platforms as a competitor to to us at the agency. Um, it was to me it was just a step on the on the potential client's journey. Let them go to Fiverr, get burnt, and then I'll pick them up after. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. Just to, before we go to a break, I think you're. I've been thinking about this quite a bit, but and I see it very like the car industry, the car maintenance industry. You you have a certain clientele that have a certain car, and they're just interested in, in getting the cheapest right mechanics the they can find. And then you have people that have slightly better cars, and then they're looking more for the competence of the mechanic plus right. a competitive right. price, but they're not looking for the cheapest, right. right? And then you have people that bought a brand new BMW or Mercedes on, and they just send it to the dealership because they, they they just don't want to handle any of it. And it, they've got a BM, brand new BMW and a brand new Mercedes. And yeah. I see that with... Um, they send to the specialist. Well, it's a different attitude, and it, you find a different attitude when, especially when people are making actual money from their website. Um, I've found their attitude about the website totally changes if they're clearly making money. A results in B, and B is increasing their bank account. <laughs> Their attitude to their website completely changes. But I, would, I would say I, I agree, but th there is there is this point that um, uh, the the lower tier clients, the ones that just want a website for the sake of having a website, they don't think about making money from the website, so they never even get to this point that it's a, that it's a revenue generation machine, um, as it is for a SaaS or for for us, you know, for people that know how to build those funnels, build the, uh, get up there on Google and all those stuff. That's right. We're going to go for our break. We'll be back. We'll be discussing all things about somebody that's moved from the digital agency area into SaaS and what he, what have some of his problems have been and what tips and insights he's got. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back. You've been listening to a couple of our other great sponsors, and I just want to say we are very appreciative of their support of the show and of the tribe. Um, so let's go on with this great interview. Um, so you started our, our room, which I butch every time. It makes you <laughs> laugh, though, doesn't it? Uh, um, you know, what have been some of the real challenges that you faced in, in, because I think you went to the SAS model straight away, you because know, you've been involved in WordPress and then it, it was a it's a plugin, but linked to a SAS model, isn't it? Uh, right, it wasn't like this from the get go. So we released a plugin. Uh, initially, it was just like a standalone plugin, and I have I have a other, I have a few other plugins that are. Most people don't know about. They're kind of like a passive income, really, for me at this point. There's one that one uh, developer that does the support. Um, I check up on them once a month, uh, but they generate the revenue every every month. So I had a pretty good experience with some some plugins uh, uh, um, that we built through the agency, even for some clients uh, at the agency. And then we started selling them uh, with their agreement and, and stuff like that. Um, so, um, uh, so I was like, yeah, let's let's do a plugin. You know, I, I, I think I think we fought with because we built this as a solution for us. We knew that it worked and it worked like magic. Uh, Jonathan, it was like 
transformative. You know, it wasn't just like a, like a WooCommerce add-on. You know, it's, it wasn't a line of code. It was something that really made an impact on my own business. So I, so I thought that it could make a, a huge difference to a lot of other people's businesses as well. So we pushed it out as a plugin. Um, about two months in, we saw the need to become a SaaS. <laughs> uh, so uh, and that is from a few from a few aspects. First of all, the the first thing that led us was the user. Um, the users uh, needed a centralized area to manage all of those communications that were coming on because basically what Atarim does or what WP Feedback, the plugin, used to do is just you put it on a client's website and. Uh, and it allows you to annotate or visually collaborate right on the website itself, right? And so um, uh, uh, that was great. It, it gave that, it removed that barrier uh, of uh, of communication and collaboration between the client and the, and the agency. Uh, but then the agency still needed to go to each one of their 50 websites, 100 websites, to check what was going on in there, to check the stickers and all of those kind of things. So a centralized area made sense from the user's point of view. And that is what we built. Uh, so we released the plugin in um, like May. And in October, there was already like a Laravel React based um, dashboard uh, that was um, uh, that was feeding all of this information there. Um, and you were asking about one of the challenges, and this was an interesting one, and I didn't predict this. Um, we, by October, we knew we were SaaS, right? But everyone saw us as a plugin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that was a huge challenge because a SaaS has a completely different um, cost attached to it. And not only the hosting stuff, but developing, um, developing a, a platform is like a completely different game than developing a plugin, right? You have to have everything. You build everything from scratch. Uh, and not only that the salaries for the team are much higher than a WordPress developer, uh, but, the, um, but the infrastructure needs to be created from scratch for every single thing that you do. You need, you need um, even the basic stuff like a login system, right? Uh, it do doesn't exist unless you build it. Um, a, you know, a restriction on a, on a feature doesn't exist unless you build it. Um, with plugins, it's a lot easier. You have hooks and the, the WordPress framework makes it super easy to build and maintain. So that's why a lot of plugins are at a very short, small, uh, I, I think the entire industry is underpriced anyway, uh, but that's what allows plugins to stay um, rather cheap, if you know what I mean, uh, compared to cloud-based applications. And um, so that's why we rebranded. We had, and it took about a, a year and a half of, of trying to battle it out with users and say, but we're not a plugin. Why are you saying we're a plugin? You know, stop saying it's a plugin. It's not a plugin. It's a SaaS with a plugin, like Hotjar has a plugin. Facebook have a plugin to install the pixel, you know? Yeah, I've got a quick, I got a quick question about that yeah. because you. And it's not a criticism. It's just I'm just interested in your view about this. But you're, you've emphasised in the difference between a plugin and a SaaS. But how yeah. major you're, you, you're sponsoring the show for a period of time? But our biggest sponsor, Castos, they they still offer a plugin, yeah. which is a pod, you know one of the leading um, WordPress plugins if you if you want to do podcasting right? right and then they offer this hosted service which is superb by the way i'm not just saying that because they sponsor the show it really is fantastic so they've still got their plugin and they've still got their SaaS business why did you not think you could combine the both? right so we do have a plugin but to, uh, we the the plugin is uh is was renamed as the client interface plugin because really that's what it is um, it's a tool that you use on the front end to interact with the with the software on the back end and to have all of the stuff that we have inside the agency dashboard built into WordPress that would be crazy you know like uh, just from just from the um, um, just from the reliability point of view you would need like 
70 more plugins to create what we created uh, into, into this application. Uh, so, um, so it had to be like, like that, you know, you can't do it, you know, in a WordPress website uh, that is well, going to be. Uh, we have to discuss that some more in the bonus content over to you, Stephen. Yeah, um, <clears throat> before we on, went on break, you were talking about how website development has become a um, commodity. Know, a commodity, thank you. Uh, a, com a commodity product. Do you think that um, everything eventually devolves to commodity based? Like, will someday user feedback on a website and managing that like devolve to a commodity? Or yes. are there some areas that will never? Like no, everything, everything gets commoditized over time. Uh, that is the nature of technology, and you just need to be at the forefront, and you need to evolve uh, beyond that. So, um, uh, um, you know, you can look at this from a project management point of view. Um, when I when I first started, uh, we were paying a whole lot for project management. Um, you know, for a project management tool. Um, now it's um, um, it's rather cheap, you know. There's there's a lot of players out there. They raised a whole bunch of money. It's um, it, it's cheap. Um, um, with uh, with what we're doing, um, there are very very few people out there that are um, trying to do the same uh, type of concept. Um, they go about it in a different way. So my edge was saying, all right, instead of being a feature which is what uh, you would find uh, in uh, some of the other solutions out there, just, just the feature itself. Um, I wanted to be the one that consumes the entire problem. And that gives the user a solution that gives them the cake, you know, that gives them a cake with candles on top already lit, you know. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. So, uh, so, so they don't need to worry about anything. You just come in, you plug it in and you play. Um, it, instead of patching things together, you know, but, you know, is, is Word, uh, you know, Wo Microsoft Word is commoditized, you know, you can do, use it for free on Google. Uh, they killed it. Uh, yeah. Do you think it's important um, as like an agency, if you're starting to look at building a site, right, like it's becoming that commoditized product as you're talking about, is it important to find non-commoditized things or do you think it's a viable strategy to say like no we're just going to win the commoditized game i mean charmin ultra does you know with the toilet paper brand uh charmin like does like billions of dollars of toilet paper sales i don't know what their profit margin on is on that at all um but is that a, like is that a viable strategy for an agency to just say like nope we're going to embrace a co this commodity thing or do you think it's important for a, for a company to always figure out how to how to get ahead of that and innovate right. with technology and stuff so um, and no, 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 it's it's not a matter of uh, so if you're a SaaS or if you're you know like a super uh, if you're a technology based tool yeah you gotta innovate and you gotta be uh, you gotta have an edge always that's why you can never stop building but as an agency you can have a different game uh, as an agency you can be niched down or you you can be the specialist and when you're the specialist you're creating a natural edge already. Uh, but more than that, you don't need many people, you know, you don't need billions of people to become your clients. You don't need millions of people. You don't even need thousands. You just need like a, a few hundreds over the course of 10 years to make a good living for yourself and for your family. Um, so there's plenty of that out there. As long as you place yourself at a place that is not looking at, you know, someone, if someone was talking to us and saying, what, I can build this myself on Wix. Cool. Please go do it. Go ahead. I'll send you a guide on how to do it. <laughs> send them a guide on how to do it. Uh, so that uh, they see how hard it is and come back. And, and some didn't, which is fine. Most of them are not in business anymore. You know, they were never, they were never going to become a long-term client. The ones that want to run a business, they want to rely on professionals to work with them. Um, so, um, and so you you can become the big agency that that does uh, the you know like like that's what Yellow Pages did. You know, um, they became the the one of the biggest agencies in the world. They build websites for 100, 200 bucks, and um, it's a template website. You get ten of them. Choose this thing. What is your color? You're good to go. And yeah, next, let's do thousands of them. 
ten thousands, millions of them. Uh, so this is a model, but uh, I, I think I think this is not really. It's more of a productized service than a than an than an agency at this point, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fantastic. We're going to continue this re great conversation in the bonus content section, which you can watch on the WP Tonic YouTube channel and on the WP Tonic Facebook group page, the Mastermind group page. Um, so, Vito, how can people find out more about your thoughts and your company and what you're up to? Uh, so, um, you can join our Facebook group at uh, the Atarim uh, agency, Web Agencies Community. And you can find me on Twitter, uh, Vito Peleg. And, of course, check out atarim.io. Um, if you're building websites for clients, um, we can help you a lot. Yes, and you can get a really special offer if you go to the WP Tonic um, website, um, stroke newsletter, go there, and you'll be able to sign up for the newsletter, but you also will be offered a special deal on Vito's great service as well. Stephen, how can people find out more about you and what you are up to? Uh, head over to hustlefish.com. That's great. I just want to tell you our... Next week's guest is Morton Henderson from um, Senior Trainer at LinkedIn Learning, um, a great friend, a personal friend, and a great friend of the show like Vito. And we're going to be delving in about the future of e-learning in the medium to the short and medium term, how technology will affect e-learning. It's going to be from one of the great experts on it and a great trainer. It's going to be a great conversation. So please join us live for that conversation on the WP Tonic YouTube channel at 9am Pacific Standard Time next Thursday. Um, Vito, thanks for the conversation. Like I say, we'll be continuing this which you'll be able to see in the bonus content. We'll see you next week, folks. Bye. So um, I think before we go, I'd like to go over some of the things you said uh, during the podcast, but I've got kind of one final formic question. Um, <laughs> if you could go back to your early days where you were doing like the first year of your web design when you were doing it full time um you kind of thrown the hat in like but like what what if you could go back and advise yourself what would you have said what advice would have you given right. yourself um i would i would advise not to not to focus on team growth because uh, eventually we got to a team of 12 uh, but uh, and we were profitable, but we weren't amazingly profitable. Uh, so I was managing a lot of people for not a lot of uh, not what you'd expect when you're talking about managing a team of twelve people. Uh, so what I would suggest, uh, and I and I see a lot of people making the same uh, the same uh, uh, going down the same path. Uh, so um, it's not about the amount of people; it's about the the bottom line, the amount of not even the revenue, it's the profit. How much profit can you generate from your, uh, from your business? And that is, the, that is really the game to play. Like at the end of the month, how much is left in your pocket? That's a hard game to play, but that's the right one. I think that's very true words. Um, before I throw it back over to Stephen, I just want to, you remarked um, your reply about your attitude to what Castos is doing. I, I'm in, I'm interested to delve in a little bit more about that because I don't really I didn't totally agree or understood your attitude about that right. be, because um, you could you because the Castros they use their plugin as a way of introducing their hosting platform um, because they're very tied together you know the plugin does the interface. Um, yeah. on your WordPress website if you want to display your podcast. Yeah. But you need a hosting well, you, a hosting service that helps you with the RSS feed. 
Did you not consider to do the same? Like you could have a mini version of your plugin that offers a certain amount of functionality, and then you got these extra services which your SaaS product, which would be a similar model to Castos. So they, uh, I'm not really familiar with them, but it sounds like they have like a freemium model, right? Where it's like a, you get a free version on the repo where it's just like self-hosted, small. No, you... they're just offering a plugin that displays the 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 um, player on the WordPress website, just the player right. of the podcast. But then you need a secondary service we don't. You could host it on your own website. The right. files. Just the file. so they just yeah. offer a more convenient with yeah. feature with a lot of additional features. So what what I mean by this is that m my approach to building the dashboard was to create the centralized area, because um, how many podcasts do you have, Jonathan? You have one, maybe two. But when you're talking to agencies, um, some of them have 900 websites on our system for one user. How are you going to go between 900 websites to see which requests are coming in from one to the next? It's it's crazy. Uh, so um, so so you want to have a place, and even on the smaller tier, on the smaller tiers, it, maybe the freelancer has 10 websites. That's also a bit of a you know annoying to just jump between the sites uh, all day long, uh, which is what we did. Uh, you know, we did uh, we did go between the websites, not 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 even even before we had our tool. Uh, but uh, when a client sent a message, you got to go to the website, find that login, get in there, figure out what, what to do and how to do it. And when you're doing it at scale, you're, you're, per, you're probably visiting about 20 to 25 websites a day. Uh, you, you should have a home. You know, you should have a place where you have, you have like a place with all the doors. You know, so you just open the door. Oh, and I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, but the only thing that I... I don't totally agree. Is this black and white that you either your plugin or your SaaS? Right. What I'm interested in personally myself is that the, a blending of the two, which so with, yeah, go on. creating two types of products: one that is just a standalone po uh, plugin, and the other one this. So yeah, that is a valid uh, option without a lot of the bells and whistles that uh, that uh, we built into the dashboard. That that is where we, it started. It started as a standalone plugin, but I would also say that uh, some uh, some of the user requests pushed us to this direction because, for example, um, um, let's let's say and not let's say it happened. Uh, it happens uh, all the, every day. Let's uh, you have 100 tasks on a website, right? Over time, you would have 100 client requests on that website, or a thousand client requests on that website. Uh, a thousand client requests doesn't only mean a thousand posts that are saved into your database. It means that every post has three to five comments inside of it, right? So that's already like 5,000, 7,000 lines uh, uh, just on this font, but not even talking about saving the statuses, the urgency, the screenshots, all, all the files that they upload in there is sitting inside the media folder. So one of the most common requests was... Uh, um, we should offload that we should offload all of this data off of the cl their clients' websites and host this. Uh, oh, in totally this totally understandable. Stuff. Over to you, Steve. Do you think that um, it's more like decisions like that is more of a marketing decision and a marketing function or a business um, like operational? decision like when you were thinking about how you were handling the plugin or not like what did you approach it from a marketing angle or like an operations angle and uh, no uh, well i had to I, I figured out the marketing side of the SaaS like a year and a half after uh, which i realized we needed to 10x the prices uh, in order for us to uh to make it uh, sustainable um uh, but uh, but but it was purely a decision that came from user requests because we got some really nice traction early on, uh, and um, and we, we already had like a couple of thousand users by the end of year one um, that were just asking for stuff. So I just wanted to serve them. I, I, my, my approach to the product uh, 
first of all is and you probably see me inside the Facebook group and uh, you know inside uh, on social media and doing those those kind of things I very much I love the fact that we uh, we put it as a as a as one of our um, core values uh, to get feedback from users mm -hmm. in the same way because it started as a feedback plugin so it made sense to just put this as one of the core values uh, but it, it really worked out amazingly because I'm so in tune with what the industry needs um, that I just build what people say and and uh, you know I, I always I always say this that uh, that um, I love the product, but I'm not in love with it. If you want to, if 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 our users in bulk are gonna come to us and say this shouldn't be like this, it should be like that, I will look into it, you know. And we're probably gonna do something about it. Um, so, um, um, for example, uh, I hope today, if not today, then on Monday, we're releasing a support desk, an email support desk. Um, which is going to allow people to, you know, drop Zendesk and uh, a fresh desk and all of those kind of things and bring an inbox into this centralized communication area. And now, in my mind, when I first started this thing, I think that email is the worst idea for communication on websites that you can have uh, because that's where all the problems start when you're communicating on email. Uh, but the... But the um, uh, but the truth is, is that 71% of the industry is using emails to collaborate with their clients. Uh, so um, so uh, um, I see the synergy there. And what I, well, instead of just keep resisting to it, um, we came up with a really interesting way of incorporating email into our system that will still integrate into the websites in a oh, innovative way. So you're way. kind of going, I forgot what it's called. Are you, is it? Are you utilizing a sim similar to the base camp product? I forgot what they called it because they got management. Um, no, it, they've got a hybrid email service. It, uh, um, but unfortunately, I've forgotten the name, so I shouldn't have brought it up. But I think, do you know what I'm talking about, Stephen? They've got this. I, no, I don't. But I think it's interesting that you brought up base camp because, like, as I've watched your product grow, you know, like, it's becoming more and more like a, a like almost a project management software with like yeah. all the features and stuff. Um, you still talk about it like a feedback, like as its core functionality, but it's starting to bleed more and more into the project um, yeah. side of things. Do you is that a goal of yours to take it into right. like the project management side, or are you still trying to keep it very much feedback centric? And of course, there's going to be some overlaps. Right. So I look at this. It's kind of um, um, our system is an is a is kind of a hybrid. It's a uh, it's a, a communications and projects uh, and all uh, brought in together. But really, the the differentiator and the the interesting thing that that gets me up in the morning is that it's not another base camp, click up, Asana, Monday. You know where you are just dropped into um, a blank sheet. And you need to know what you're doing in those systems. And even then, it will never be designed for our specific needs. Because by design, it's designed to serve as many people as possible. Um, so, um, so what we do is we look at the exact challenges and day-to-day -day clicks, literal clicks that uh, web designers and freelancers uh, are uh, and web agencies are doing every single day and say, okay, this guy's clicking this thing five times a day, how can we make this zero, right? Uh, um, okay, he's, he's going in there and he's uploading files. Every time that he gets a file from a user, uh, from a client, the file goes into Dropbox. So, he, so the agency or the project manager or the developer needs to go into Dropbox, download to their computer, go to TinyPNG, upload it to TinyPNG, download it again to their computer, Go back to the web, go into the website, upload it to the uploads folder, and then use the image. So we said, oh, we can make it a button, right? So we created the push to media folder, you know. So you have a button that optimizes, and you get the image from the client into the Im into the media folder if you choose with a click of a button, or the logins where you need to manage sys passwords and you get different subcontractors that have your passwords and what do you do if you don't work with them anymore you go to 50 websites and change the passwords and all of this kind of uh, nonsense so we removed the use of passwords um you know for for these things so 
this is just like um, uh, the, the, uh, the tip of the iceberg, but even how you look at tasks. So when you're working at email, when you're doing a revision for a website, you are, you're, you're not doing one revision. You're doing a revision round, right? You have 20, 30, 15 uh, tasks to go through one by one. So um, I was looking at it from little, from from the from the the uh, how our mind, how our brain reacts to doing this on email or inside those project management systems. What happens there in an email? You go, you you get an inbox. Your inbox is like loads of lines. You click through. You're in the screen, right? You're in the in the screen itself where you have the request. Where you finish the request, you go back to the inbox. Orientation, orientation. And then you go to, you find yourself into the next one. You go back in and you do this one. So there is no anchor. And uh, in the same way that when you go to the, you know how sometimes uh, you sit in the living room and you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to get a glass of water. You go to the kitchen and by the time you got there, your brain got like a reset. And it's like, wait, what, what, what? Oh, yeah, the water. Uh, so that happens to us uh, in, in small fragments every time that we look at our inbox. Uh, but when you're doing it 40 times a day, 50 times a day, then it becomes significant. And when you have a team of 10, 20, 100 people that are all doing this 20, 40 times a day, then you're already talking about full-on salaries that are being wasted per year. Just from this tiny, tiny thing, Stephen. So um, what we did is we just put the tasks next to it so that you can you have an anchor. It never moves. You, you never lose your location, you know. So these are stuff that you don't think about if you're not uh, extremely zoomed in on a specific industry. And that is what I said about agencies as well. Uh, if you find your niche, you'll find your specialty. Uh, Jonathan knows stuff about building LMSs that I will never know, even though I built a company. You, you don't want to know. Right. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> oh, Maybe this entire Maybe story we'll, that I just Maybe we'll tell you that. Uh, yeah. um, just but you see what I mean, yeah? Yeah. Before we wrap up the bonus content, and I think it's been a great discussion, you know, um, what are some of the uh, – how long have you been running the the actual – this side of your business? You know, it's been over right. three years now, hasn't it? Two, yeah, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Um, lead generation. Um, can you give a quick – what are – you know, obviously, what have been some of the things that have worked for your business and some of the things that you thought were going to work that haven't worked in in actually getting, you know, let's be frank about it, really leads that buy your product? What are, right. Can you give to the audience some of the things that have worked for your business and some of the things that haven't? Yeah. So the thing that works best is happy clients. That is, I think, the... Um, <laughs> the... No, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I might as well just go and shoot myself because I'm not being <laughs> around for a right good. Uh, that is just, you know, the biggest uh, growth hack that you can have. Just keep your clients happy. Uh, and they'll, they'll not only come back for more, but they'll talk about you. Um, and one thing that I did realize uh, is that you have to bring in new blood if you want to keep this referral flywheel going, because uh, even if you have the the most amazing, you know, the if you invented sliced bread, after you had a few slices, then it's just bread, right? You get used to everything in life. So uh, so bringing in new blood that that experience this uh, transformation that we are able to give to our users, uh, um, they keep the wheel rolling uh, so this is this is the biggest one but how do you bring them uh yes. jonathan so um a, a, um we we have a bunch of activities the the one that uh the one that the way that i would like to look at this is that i i uh, we have two categories we have the nets and we have the fishing rods right so uh with the nets we're looking for communities that we can um, um basically tap into if you will or just connect with and add value and uh, just be super supportive of the challenges, the experiences that they are having, and just be there when they are having our challenge. Um, fortunately, we have the biggest challenge in the industry. Uh, we're solving the biggest challenge, uh, really, which uh, or, or the, the system um, um, 
tackles the biggest pain point that we all experience. So it does happen uh, pretty often that I that from my experience and my research and just talking to thousands of agencies, I can add a lot of value into these uh, categories. Um, uh, so these are the Facebook groups. These are this is this you know like uh, WP Tonic and working with other products that have audiences, um, um, hosting companies, and uh, you know getting getting uh, uh, publications and all this kind. Of, these these are like you cast a net, and sometimes uh, you come up empty. Sometimes you pick up a toilet, you know, in the net. Uh, but sometimes you get a bunch of fish as well. Uh, and then the fishing rod is more about um, uh, finding the interesting agencies. So that is like, a, a, and that is really is about um, kind of relationship building with them. Uh, so uh, with with those agencies, these are you know like for example Brad's agency. I just I just texted him, texted him uh, uh, today that I want to do a case study with uh, WebDev uh, Studios. Because I didn't know, but they're using our product. So I, f I found out uh, that uh, from that Bob WP uh, built his new website using our system as a client because they built his website uh, there. So he told me, and so I reached out to Brad and let's try and do some stuff together. Let's showcase uh, yeah. those uh, bigger that, ones. That would be a fantastic case study, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 one hundred percent. So um, um, to wrap yeah. up, just to say to you, Vito, one of the things I admire about you is that you've got a, um, uh, you're a very effective marketer, but you've got a more sophisticated attitude than some other people in the in, in the WordPress space, because you're kind of still in WordPress because they're most about. You also got your SaaS, but you seem to understand in a more sophisticated way how the game is played and that's not a patronizing statement there because a lot of people don't really un i'm amazed at the amount of people that are pretty successful and well known but they they don't seem to have a short medium or long-term strategy right. um and i'm always amazed at the short-term view that a lot of people have um, where I think you need them if obviously if you're very short of money or desperate you can't you can only have a short term view um, but it's like having a kind of strategy for the short the medium long term these buckets would you agree with that statement or do you think I'm just waffling yeah no this is uh this is definitely something that I that I put from from day one because I got into this game to scale further beyond the what the what my agency uh, was able to give me uh, and um, you know like a few years ago and, and the, the long term plan does change but it's but there's always one there's always a long term plan you know uh, it, you have to pivot with the market and uh, pivot with uh, your own experiences. For example, when I when I was in the agency, my my goal was I wanted to build a forty people agency, right? To me, that that meant that we were doing um, eight figures in uh, revenue. Um, that's how I kind of uh, quantified it. If I'm going to get to forty people with the revenue we're doing now, we're probably going to be at, at eight figures per year. Uh, so um, uh, so that was my goal. But it was like extremely hard to build a big agency, and I really appreciate, I really uh, uh, value um, the effort that some of those bigger one, bigger agencies that are out there are putting into this, uh, into their business to, to make this happen. You know, it really is a pretty hard game to play uh, because it's very personalized and it's very hands-on. Um, the product seemed like a better way to get to that goal. So, um, so the eight figure number stayed and just the path changed. So I did have that North star, but really as soon as I started the product and I saw the potential of what this can do, I 10 X it. Uh, so, uh, so now it's the nine figure is the, is the, is the goal. And it's going to take 10 years. It's not going to be something that's going to happen, uh, you know, in a year or, or two or even five, it's going to take a, it's going to be a 10 year journey. Um, but this has been the note style um, after about three, four months after I, I yeah. saw what we're dealing with. Uh, well, you've just opened a whole new discussion. You have to come back on the show in the new year because um, I think we we can go down a whole different path with what you've just said. 
Um, but thanks, Vito, for coming on the show. I think it's My been pleasure. a fantastic discussion. Um, we'll see you next week, Tribe, for another, well, it's going to be another great discussion with Morton Hendricks and God knows where that conversation's going to go. It could go anywhere, no, Morton. Um, I'm sure he will tell me off and put me in my place, as he often does. As often, only your friends can put you in where you deserve to be put. Um, we'll see you next week, Tribe. Bye. Bye, everyone.